Hey everybody, welcome to Local Business Hacks Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Case, and I'm on a mission to help you. Every week we're gonna be talking to local business owners and experts to get their best tips, tricks, and hacks to grow your business. This show's designed to teach you, inspire you, and motivate you to take massive action and start to build your future-proof business. Whether you're just starting off or you're taking your existing business to the next level, this episode is for you. So let's get started. Hey, local business hackers. I'm your host, head of global business development for Referizer, Carl Case, joined today by Brandon Cullen, chief concept officer of Metabolic. Brandon, welcome to Local Business Hacks. And thank you for having me, Carl. I'm looking forward to it. So Brandon, you don't obviously become the overnight chief concept officer of an emerging fitness brand. Talk to me about your journey and how it got you to this point. Yeah, it definitely was uh, that overnight success story. Like everyone says, we're about 11 years in now, uh, this specific concept. So late 2000s, long before the, the rise of boutique fitness, I guess I would say in general, you kind of had only uh, like polar opposite ends of the spectrum. So you had sports specific training on one end, and then you kind of had your typical um, YMCA type boot camps. Um, you know the the bigger the bigger gym class based structures that were offered as part of your membership within that gym. At this time was also the kind of like explosion or the the starting of CrossFit. No one knew at the time how how much legs it would actually have and how disruptive it would be. We even played around in the space early on, long before it was popular or it was even known. It was just such a different game at that point because everyone in your doors were high-level athletes or had a background in uh, more technical lifting, intensity, and all those things that go along with uh, the sport of fitness. So when it started hitting pop culture, based on our backgrounds in in, um, just athletics, me and my partner both come from a professional hockey background. So we had like a lot of great training that just didn't fit into either of these worlds. And we said, you know what, there's probably something in the middle uh, to train everyday people, not exactly like athletes, but using a lot of the same properties in a much safer platform. Uh, so that's that's the short story. We set out about 11 years ago to build something in the middle. And now it's kind of morphed into its own methodology where in the the pop culture group fitness space, you know, I kind of like to to use that term. I think it's kind of cheeky. We're not always known. We're known for experience, but not always known for quality of training. I don't think too many people will get too angry at that statement. We try to do something a little bit different in that space, offering not only the experience, but all, but also some very, very high level training for everyday people. I love that. And for people trying to get involved with the brand, where are you guys at today? Where are you looking to go? How can, how can our listeners get involved? Probably the best way is, um, depending if you're a social media person, at Metabolic gives a good snapshot of our look and feel and tone. If you're interested in more of the franchising side of the business that I focus on, the the growth and development, there are pretty easy things within the website just at metabolic.com that will push you in, in the right direction to do that. Amazing. And if people are trying to get involved on a local level, where is Metabolic located today? Where where so as of today, and I always get my partners are always yelling at me because we're growing so fast, but I can confidently say today we have 25 units open. We have three opening in the next six weeks, and we have another, I'd say, 12 pegged to open in 2023. With that being said, we have another 50 under contract in the portfolio that will develop over the next two to three years or so. Amazing. Congratulations on that growth. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So transitioning a little bit off of Metabolic specifically and focusing on you, the title of our podcast is Local Business Hacks. And being in the position that you're in within the brand, looking to strategize as to how can we grow both our franchisees currently and us as a brand, what are some stories that you've learned that taught you lessons that you're consistently reminded on, hey, I paid that idiot tax 11 years ago when I was forming the company, and now here we are today. What are some things that you can shed light on in regards to that topic? 
Well, help me understand what is how, how do you guys define hack? Like what would be a good way to define hack? Yeah, so something that gives you that upper upper edge on your competition or on your staff that, you know, is something that Brandon brought to the table. And what was that story that really honed in to where you made sure that you're never going to let somebody else in your circle learn that lesson again? Well, number one, anything that I have brought to the table, I've definitely borrowed or stole from someone smarter than me. I think, uh, I think one of my own personal gifts and my partner that I kind of work back and forth with is we're, we're good at organizing information from a lot of different places. And then making it somewhat fit our brand. You don't have to be first, right? You just have to do it different or better, offer something unique. One of the things that I'm seeing shift dramatically in our world is the idea of starting your business day one, the way you'd like it to operate in year five. And a lot of that is paying early. You know what I mean? Is like making sure that you surround yourself with some of the... Um, I don't even want to say best people in the industry because in my opinion, you need the buy-in, that emotional buy-in from that staff member or teammate. They want to, they want to come along for the ride with you. So I think that's super important. And then the biggest miss that I see and not just fitness, I think people go too broad. I think people try to reach too many people and try to please too many people. If your agenda is inclusiveness awesome you know there's nothing wrong with that on the human side of things i very much am that person it just might not be the smart business approach if you're trying to carve a niche in a very crowded ecosystem so even like looking at our products sometimes because the fitness industry you know everyone talks about it being so we're all part of one big team but i mean it's as catty as is <laughs> as any industry can get, right? And I think zeroing in on your core customer, prioritizing them while blocking out all the other noise is probably the first thing you should do with any venture. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing advice. Broad is definitely a word that's not looked at enough in the fitness industry, but too many people take it and run with it. So I love yeah. that. Transitioning a little bit, you're a leader. How would you say that your leadership style is and how does the team really adapt to that leadership style of yours? Um, well, it's shifting, right? It, it used to be very easy to lace up your boots and lead by example. And lately I've been thrust into, and I've been talking a lot about this lately because it's something I do want to get better at. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of a difference between being a leader and being a manager of people. The people I respect the most in my circle of friends have this amazing knack to manage people, to give enough space in a room, to give everyone enough of a voice while not compromising their values. I've always been able to be a visionary and not sounding egotistical, but I think if I'm passionate about something, I can get people to come along with me for the ride. But managing people is a completely different thing that I've often struggled at uh, from time because I'm very black and white and the world's not always black and white. I know this. So the bigger we get, the more of this managing people comes into play, the more personalities, the more voices are in every conversation. And if there's one thing that I'm trying to get better at is it's that aspect of the business. It's not so much relationship building is easy when you're just sharing the vision. It's easy to get people excited, but to keep people engaged and feel supported, that's something that's not always been uh, my strongest quality and something that I just hope to just keep getting better at or at least be aware of. It doesn't have to be my best quality, but you can always, you can always get a little bit better. Awesome. Continuous improvement. Yeah, that's all you can hope for, right? Of course. So when we talk about what metabolic is in this space, especially stateside, keep in mind, we have listeners all over the globe, but when we talk domestically in the US, you guys have a lot of competition blanketly in the fitness space. How do you thrive off of that competition? And how does it aid you in selling franchises today? If you look at the fitness industry as an ignorant blanket statement here, which I have to make to then 
sell my bias, right? Uh, <laughs> I guess it only works that way is typically the industry chases a lot of gimmicks. Uh, a lot of the concepts that I compete with do very, very well, 25 and under, 40 and over, very, very heavily female dominated. And we're pushing weight loss, weight loss, lengthening and tone, um, all those buzzwords, right? Okay, I get it. It's fine. I actually would admit that that's a bigger market than what I am chasing here, right? We found this this sweet spot, like right in the middle of 25 to 40, I would say, for our female population, 30 to 45 for the male population. We have a very good balance between men and women, which is great. And also, too, it's just a little bit more of this like... Our people want like the best out of life. They want, they want the best coffee on the way to the gym. They want the best wheatgrass protein, weird shake on the way out. And they want an awesome workout on the training floor. They expect quality. They'll pay for experience. They demand results. And if you don't perform, they're going elsewhere. Um, so as non-inclusive as that may sound, it is our core consumer, the 25 to 45 year old high performer. They very much are an everyday person from a physicality and body type. But for whatever reason, they just have something between their ears that drives them forward. They're driven, highly motivated individuals. And what we try to do is we try to prioritize that and cater to them versus saying, everyone is welcome or everyone can do this workout. Everyone is welcome. And everyone can do this workout so long as you show up to do the work. Um, so I don't know. Did that did that summarize it well enough? Yeah, I think you know, positioning yourself in your own circle that really tailors to a specific audience instead of being the everything for everyone, like the Planet Fitnesses of the world and the Big Box gyms. And then even as you look at Orange Theory, Orange Theory definitely tailors to that middle aged single mom or whatever it may be in the female space and isn't really inclusive to everyone of a, a demographic that could thrive in their four walls. Well, not only that, they do an unbelievable job at it. They cater to that community. They prioritize everything from the way their lobby to their music to the everything they do makes that community, they cater to this community to do it the best. And the funny thing is, is the Orange Theory consumer is the soul cycle consumer. It is the pure bar consumer. It is the hot yoga consumer. Like when I say that's a busy space, it's busy. It's crowded. I know why that works. I know why there's a lot of people that really enjoy those workouts. And these companies do a fantastic job. I just feel more comfortable with this kind of like laser focus sniper approach versus more of a shotgun approach. I think also from a results perspective that your members are going to see results quicker knowing that who you're dealing with and tailoring workouts specifically towards that demographic. We're in a results business. If they're not seeing that result, they're going next door. So how do we deliver the results? And the best way to do that is for a specific consumer. Yeah. And the, the result we, we produce is one of our uh, biggest retention tools. Like it's not the easiest thing to throw on a, a billboard or, or, in a, in a pamphlet, right? But the fact that our average life cycle of our clients between two and three years, when the industry standard is three to six months, is quite a bit of a difference. And I think that, and I, you know, I wish I could say it was just the stimulus we provide on the, the workout floor, but part of that goes to the type of consumer that commits to coming in four days a week, that prioritizes rest, that, you know, eats like they give a shit, for lack of a better term. And um, so it's a little bit of both. Yes, I think we offer the best, we offer the best product on the market from a strength and conditioning component for everyday people, but you need the right kind of people to get the right kind of result that drives that retention. Yep, 100%. I'm glad that you're positioning the brand to be that way so that we see a metabolic on every corner. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal. Maybe not every quarter because, (laughs) uh, but I think, uh, and that's another thing about our growth model, right? 
the same growth in orange theory, and I'm just using orange theory, whoever's listening, because it was brought up and it's a, it's a powerhouse of a brand. The fact that they can chase um, 1,000 to 1,500 units in the United States, you've got to also know that they also have that reach to do that. When we see an orange theory, let's say I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if we have 12 to 15 orange theories, you know, a metabolic will probably put between, I'd say four and five, like a third or a fourth of that. And that's, that's what we want to do. It's not that we're trying to be greedy, but we're also well aware that there's less of that market. And here's our goal. We think if we isolate the 50 top markets in the United States and based on psychographics and demographics in the area drop two to five units. I think that gets us to 200 without being greedy. And I think uh, by doing it that way, we can keep that quality control up and allow metabolic to be the thing that we, uh, we dreamt about uh, over a decade ago. Amazing. Brandon, you just said a word that none of my podcasters has, have ever used. And it's something that I preach and it's psychograph. Uh, oh. I would love for you to dive into that word and how metabolic uses that today, because for those of you listening, this is, could be one of the most important lessons that you'll ever learn, ever learn. All right. I'll try to use the context that we've been speaking about here with some kind of high level brand. So we're looking at, I don't want to, I'm going to stay away from the name of the market, but we're looking at one of the fastest growing markets in the United States right now. We're looking at real estate. And you always get into the conversation about the metro area, the transitional hip area, or the suburbs. Almost anyone you would talk to in kind of like the real estate game would say, well, hey, this is a great neighborhood in the suburbs because this is where all the stay-at-home parents are. And my position to, to educate some of the real estate teams and our new franchisees, I'm like, you want to do the opposite of what is doing well in the suburbs. And oftentimes I use this analogy. I said, when in Orange Theory or specifically this comparison, a club Pilates, when they made their name, they did it in the suburbs to earn the right to then open in the metro areas where the younger kids are. We're the flip. We make our name by making noise in the now, millennial and Gen Z business professional area, we need to earn the right to get to the suburbs, the opposite. Now, what's, what's funny about that is um, people think of demographics like uh, household income. And I always use this example because I'm 41 years old now. I have a 10 and a seven-year-old. They both go to school. They both have after school. They both have sports. Um, I might be making more money today but when I was poor and 27 years old or 30, I had a lot more money to throw at myself and my experience. But what I tell a lot of people like the business professionals I'm chasing, they will redline their accounts for experience, for culture, for way of life. So if you put too much weight in this household income when they're a metro renter, you're losing because that person out in the suburbs has two kids maybe two and a half kids, a white picket fence, they have mortgages, they have daycare. It's not as simple as this household has $150,000 household income and this millennial has makes 60 a year. It's, it's a tough thing to explain, but the data that we have now from purchasing behavior, geofencing, all this great stuff. Like I'm a big believer is you, you could almost never even look at demographics and pay a heck of a lot of attention to psychographics. And I think you'd be in a much better place no matter who you were looking for. It still works for Club Bilates and their archetype of their core consumer, the way it works for the metabolic core consumer. I love that. Really focusing and being in 2023, we have access to those data points that 10 years ago, you'd be the FBI to have access to. <laughs> um, so utilizing that and a podcast that I recorded earlier in the week 
was about using BI tools. And we now have access to this through your CRM and your POS system to capture that data and present it in a way that's cross-brand so that you can really see if those trends are the same in the Southeast of Florida versus 10 miles North of that. And using those psychographics to really hone in on who that customer is and not just who they are on paper is, is amazing. Yeah, and it's interesting, and, and it's amazing what you can do right now because we have actually specific archetypes if we're in more of a suburban market versus a metro market. Like we have a couple different strategies based on if you're in the Midwest, if you're out west, or if you're on the East Coast. Like it is wild the kind of data we have now. I mean, you might find this hilarious just because this is, you know, your wheelhouse. But before we had access to all of this data and only the FBI did have this access, what I used to do, I always love telling this story. So say we were say we were checking out a market like Austin, Texas. Um, so I would go into the closest Lululemon and I would look at who they had on their walls for ambassadors. I'd try to not be obvious, but I'd write down like where their studio was, who this person was. And then I'd go into the parking lot and I'd find all these addresses. Once I had these addresses, you'd have like little clusters of like where gyms may be in the area. Well, I would drive to these areas of town and find the closest Starbucks and I'd buy a coffee and I'd sit for an hour and I would watch people come in the doors and be like, is this a metabolic consumer or not? And that's how I used to <laughs> choose real estate. Now, thank God we have a lot more sophisticated way to do this, but that was a pretty good strategy a decade ago. And the studios that you opened with that strategy are thriving now. Yeah, I mean, they are, and it just was a different time. There was a lot, you you had the time to do this level of hand-holding, but also, too, you just don't have to. I still think now, I still use this strategy once we have, say, pockets based on software. It's like, go hang out in the neighborhood for an afternoon and see if the metabolic consumer is walking around. Are they living, working, or playing in this area? And if they are, it's probably a good area for us to start prioritizing real estate. That's awesome. And we could spend a whole podcast on talking about how to, how to use psychographics and real estate data to, to make decisions because you never want to pop a studio up in a failing area. But I'm glad that you guys are looking into that, that you said that term, because that is a a whole lesson in itself that I hope everybody really digests and looks into that if you're not already using that term psychographics in your idea of figuring out who that ideal consumer is. Yeah. And I mean, like going back, I think a really good thing to do is to break down your client avatar, male and female. And as far as giving them a name, like we have four avatars of the type of trainers that you may fill your building with. We have avatars for the type of franchisee, whether that's owner operator, absentee owner that needs a general manager and lead trainer. If you can kind of like hone in on, like say you owned a coffee shop, well, define that consumer. He's a 30 year old tech student that listens to this kind of music and his name is this. This is his favorite style of shoe. If you can get that focused on who you want to delight on a daily basis, you're in a good place. That's a good way to start. Yeah. And then your brand can evolve from there because you know who your brand needs to target. And that goes back to when Todd Hartley was on our podcast talking about what a website really does. Some of these websites look so nice that you want to print them out, frame them and put them on your wall. And you won't drive a single member from that website ever. I know. But it's beautiful. And you want to tell the whole world about your beautiful website. Well, that's nice in theory, but your website really needs to speak to that consumer so that they really do something on it instead of just saying, yo, check out Metabolic's website. It's pretty cool looking, but I'm never going to go there. Like, that's not yep. what I want. Yeah, I heard it. And I heard a neat analogy, not related to website, but just in the same thing from any level of marketing campaign. Um, a friend of mine actually uh, uses this analogy uh, a lot. His name's Stu Brower, just in case he hears this. But he says, if you run any kind of marketing campaign, all you want is 51% of people to like it. You actually would love 49% to hate it. And that's a successful <laughs> marketing campaign. So again, you want 
the non-believers to actually not relate to it. But you want your base and your consumer to be lit up by it, excited by it. So I think that's a good way to approach kind of any of those kind of campaigns. We all want to feel special. That's right, we do. Absolutely. But you can't be special to everyone, can you? I mean, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's awesome. Brandon, I so appreciate these tips. It's amazing. I hope everybody listening really looks into this and applies these techniques to their, their emerging brand. For people that want to get connected with you, what's the best way? I'm most active on LinkedIn. Um, I jumped back in a couple years ago, and I really think from a, uh, you know, if you, if you can eliminate all the, the cold calling crap you have to deal with, it's fine. I think you can reach a lot of like-minded people if you're in um, that entrepreneurial type uh, space. So that's where I hang out. Um, I think my handle is playing guilty. Uh, like my LinkedIn handle, or I'm sure you can find me just by my, by my name, Brandon Cullen. Sweet, Brandon. Well, I appreciate having you as a guest on my podcast and I hope everybody goes and checks out a Madbolic near them. And thank you from us and our listeners all over the globe. Well, thanks for having me. It was a great conversation because it was different. It's nice to not always talk about the same thing. So I appreciate the questions. Of course. Thanks, Brandon. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you found it helpful. Be sure to head over to our site, local-business-hacks.com to check out the show notes and send me questions or ideas for future episodes. If you want to grow your business, just like the people you've heard from here, follow Local Business Hacks podcast and tune in for new tips, tricks, and tactics. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep hacking.